Hey, everybody. It's the Drive School Podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, your host, and uh, joining me today is my my good friend, Pastor Brad Amire. How you doing? You know, I'm I'm okay. It's dreary out. It's been dreary and drizzly and gross for like five days. And um, if you get the winter sads, like a lot of us do up here in North Dakota, it's not been a great few days. You know, just kind of weighs down on your soul. <laughs> Lent is looming too, so uh, let's go ahead and talk about death. Um, <laughs> uh, fits, it fits the day and the season, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So um, here's the thing: like we're, we're, we're aiming this at uh, at youth and young adults, at, at an average high school student. This is sadly kind of the age where you might actually have to have your your first sort of concrete experience with with death. This is you know that the time you might be getting ready to go to your very first funeral, um, and it's it's. Um, because it is a foreign thing and a, and, a, and a scary thing and that it is the last great enemy death. Um, it, it not only you know provokes a lot of anxiety, but there's a lot of different people doing a million different things. So um, pastor, walk me through my first funeral. Like help me understand what's going on, what's what's helpful, what's what's hopeful. Well, you know, before we get to that, can I just back up a second and just talk sure. about death in general? Um, mm-hmm. A lot of kids that I talk to, like we talk about this stuff in confirmation class and there's always, you know, a kid at grandma's funeral or whatever that goes to the church and you kind of talk to them in our line of work. But one of the things I've noticed amongst a lot of people when they're at their first funerals is just this, this, this idea that death is something that was always kind of there, but it wasn't really something you take seriously till it comes up and kind of punches you right in the face. I mean, yeah. And um, suddenly what is abstract becomes real and concrete. And it's often very hard for people to wrap their minds around that someone you love and care about and um, value is just not here. Like, and it just happens like that it's gone. Yeah. Right. And I guess I want to say that you're not alone to feel like this is bad. You're not alone to feel like this really Go sucks. Ahead. You're not alone when you really hurt because that's kind of the nature of death. You know, scripture tells us, Paul tells us in Romans 3 that the wage of sin is death, right? Because there's sin in the world, death happens. And uh, it's it's the last great enemy. It's the last thing that Christ is going to put under his feet. And uh, even though God has redeemed death in the sense that now when we Christians die, we move from this life to the next, it still is not a universally purely great thing and does serve some good purposes in God's grand design. But at the end of the day, death is death and death is not fun. And it deprives us of people that we care about. And it's okay to admit that. And it's okay to not be cool with it. Because one thing I've run into at at funerals and things is sometimes Christians get the idea in their head that if you're sad when a Christian dies, it means you lack faith or something. And that's just not true, right? We can both trust in Jesus and be really mad that somebody died. That's, That's not, those are not incompatible things. Well, Jesus hates death. I mean, Jesus hates death so much he weeps at the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus hates death so much that he's willing to die to make sure that you won't stay dead. Um, and so you're allowed to confront that. You can say, I am glad that the suffering that they were enduring, they're, they're not enduring anymore. But the way that it had to happen, like recognize that's a terrible way. I wish Jesus just came back first. I, I wish that the cure for that just came back first. I would rather there be life. And if the, the life that I'm hoping for then is life on the other side of death because of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting one for me in Christ our Lord, I want to lean on that. But death is always and always, always the, the enemy. It is. And, and one of my favorite passages about this is uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where mm-hmm. Paul says that when we grieve, we do not grieve as those without hope. And what he acknowledges in that passage and what I like to lift up for people is that we grieve. And I, I don't know about you, Harrison, but I, I've lost people very close to me that I care quite a bit about. I miss them all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I've lost you know people in my family that are close to me. And it's like you get this whole cut in this region and that hole never quite fills back in again, you know? And in fact, somebody told me that when you lose somebody, um, it's like you lose a part of yourself with them. And the thing is about that, that loss, that loss never gets smaller. It's just that as you go through life, it, it becomes more manageable because the edges heal up a little bit and you do other things, you know, you kind of grow and move on past that, but the hole's still there and it's okay to miss somebody even years after they're gone. And it's perfectly okay to want to talk about somebody that you lost, even if it's 10 years down the road, you're not a weirdo for wanting to reminisce about grandma or whoever. No. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And we Christians don't fear death. So there's no no reason why we can't sit down and tell stories or reminisce or any of these things that people like to do about those who've gone on before us. Um, we're free to do that. And in fact, in some ways, it's very nice to know that other people miss them too. You know, because one of the things I found in death is when you lose somebody you really care about, it's like after the funeral poof, everybody stops paying attention that that person's gone and your world may have come to a halt, but it seems like the rest of the world is going on. And that is such a surreal experience. 
Um, but it, other people miss them too. And uh, you're not alone when you feel like everybody else just kind of wandered away and you feel like you're alone in your grief. And I guess I just want to reiterate before we get into this, that this is exactly why Jesus came. And so if you're feeling alone in your grief, you're feeling like the whole world's forgotten your loved one. Well, Christ hasn't. God remembers them and God has re- died for them. Christ died for them in order to redeem them and to defeat death. And so even if you feel like everybody else around you's forgotten, God hasn't forgotten. He's still there with you. He knows. Uh, this is this is kind of the answer then to the question that I'm about to ask. But like with, with this in mind, what's the point of a funeral? Well, the point of a funeral is kind of a twofold thing. First and foremost, right? We want to proclaim Christ crucified who forgive the sins and to promise the resurrection to the deceased for the comfort of the family. And that's kind of the second thing, right? Is we're supposed to comfort the family, not just in general, not with cliches or, you know, the kind of stuff that people like to say at funerals, but with the real solid gospel promises. Because I can talk to you about butterflies and rainbows and I can talk to you about, you know, um, what else, you know, all the just things that people mean well to say angel wings and people getting their hair. I can say all this cliche stuff, but none of it's real. And so there's no real comfort in it. And so while I don't want to fault people for saying stuff like that, because sometimes they just don't know what to say. So they just say what somebody else told them at the funerals they have been to that were meaningful to them. But at the end of the day, the only thing that provides real comfort is the rolling back of death in the death of Christ. And so funerals first and foremost focus on that, not because we don't care about the people who are celebrating the life of at that funeral, but because Christ is the thing that makes the difference. And You know, I mean, there's really two options here, right? Either the funeral is this proclamation of the Lord who has overcome death in the grave, or it's a simple remembrance of the deceased. And if it's a simple remembrance of the deceased, then there is no hope. They're dead. That's it. It's over. It's done with. And the whole thing is really a very, very sad affair because we have hope in the midst of our grief, right? We have Christ and him crucified, who is the victor over death in the grave. There's this this distinction that kind of goes on with this. There, there's this looking back that we want to do for the people that we love because they were important to us. So we look back, but the, the funeral is also designed to look forward. Um, but but here's the the thing though: in Christ, we get to look forward only by looking back. I, I'm a big fan of the wake. I, I, I personally like. We should actually have a time where we can get together and have have food and have fellowship and tell the stories, and that's great. But it doesn't stop there because when we look back, what we find is Christ who breathed his last and then rose again. And that tells us, look forward. You will see them again. There will be a resurrection. They are with the the Lord now, and and on the last day, they will rise in their bodies. And that means that you don't have only their stories to tell, which is is good. Right. And that's, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that really jars people when they come to a confessional Lutheran funeral, because at least up here where I'm at, most of the other churches, you know, they have the funeral has really become just an extended wake. So the custom up here is we have, we call, well, if you're not a Catholic, we call them the prayer service the night before. And uh, usually that's at the funeral home. Sometimes it's at the church, but usually it's at the funeral home. And that's where people tell stories. And the pastor sometimes gets invited to say a couple prayers, but the emphasis is really on reminiscing about the deceased and, you know, celebrating the, you know, the, the funny things and the interesting things and sometimes the sad things that happened in life and just, you know, talking about all the things that, you know, they impacted various people with. That's great. It's good. We should do that. Yeah. Um, but the problem is a lot of funerals you go to, it's just that again. And so you go to the funeral and it's really more emphasizing a eulogizing of the person, you know, just talking about the events of their life. Often we really downplay their bad parts to sort of, um, you know, the, the theologians would call this constructing a hagiography, right? Making up a saint story about them. They're only perfect and good um, because we all know people need to be justified. And so if you're bad, you're, you're obviously not a righteous and holy person. So we got to ignore all that stuff <laughs> at, the, at the funeral. But when you come to a confessional Lutheran funeral, um, it's different. You walk in the door and I'll tell you what we do at our church. We, um, we get at the door, we bring the casket to the back of the church and we put the funeral pall over it. It's a white cloth that reminds us of our baptism. It's got a big old cross on it mm-hmm. to remind us that this person was covered in the cross of Christ. And there's a short little beginning part of the liturgy where we read part of Romans chapter six, all who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ reminding us that now these promises we hear about in the Bible for this person specifically, that's who they're mm-hmm. for. And then we come in on a hymn and um, I actually kind of 
Frankensteined the service in the hymnal a little bit because I, I we print out everything in little booklets because a lot of people don't uh, know how to use hymnals anymore. And even people who use hymnals don't use our hymnal necessarily. So it's just easier to print everything out. And I put um, all the parts of the liturgy that are there into setting three because that's the kind of the common service up here that everyone knows and all the old timers remember. And so we sing that stuff and it's a church service. And when we get to the sermon, yeah, the deceased person gets talked about, but only in light of what Christ has done for them. And that's very jarring for people because what people expect is prolonged eulogizing. Music selection should be just simply the person's like favorite songs of whatever genre or place. Um, But, you know, the things that we do here are to proclaim Christ and him crucified. Again, reminding us that what Christ did in the past gives this person here who we're talking about a future in the resurrection of the dead. And that's that's the point. This is not to take away from the person and 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 their stories and their likes, but it, it's it's to actually find them uh, wrapped up in something that that will carry on. That, and that that's the place that that you can have hope and, and not just sort of well loss. Because the the problem with playing somebody's favorite song at a, at a funeral is that from now on that song is just always tied to loss. And it was a song that there was enough to move them to carry it forward in a life that was a joyful. And if it's only going to be a burden to you now, something something is winning here that shouldn't be winning, that the last enemy is, is rearing its head. So the reason that we want to sing hymns, and not just any hymns, but the hymns that are talking about what's wrong in the room and where the answer is, those are the ones we want to sing so that when you are back home and you listen to that song and it comes on 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 the the, uh, the shuffle playlist because uh, we don't have radios anymore, um, then then what you have is you, you can say, this is sad because it was their favorite but i also know this the words to my redeemer lives and there's there's something there that that will speak alongside this and you know it's something i i often recommend to people and i mean even if you're not old i think this Mm. is something worth just considering but in your bible you know write down some of your favorite passages and hymns on a piece of paper because if god forbid something terrible happened to you and somebody that was responsible for planning your funeral found your Bible and opened it up. But there's this list of all these things that were meaningful to you. And the reason I recommend this, and this is kind of selfish, I'll, I'll admit, is because it makes my job a whole lot easier as a pastor. Because sometimes when the family shows up, they have a different expectation for funerals than what we Christians have. And even if they are Christians, they may have forgotten what the purpose of a funeral is. And so it's just helpful to be able to say, hey, look, this person here who passed away, they loved these things and let these things are great. And they talk about Christ. So let's do what they wanted. You know, that's, it makes my job easier when I can say grandma or whoever, this is what they expected at their funeral. Um, rather than just being me, the pastor pushing my views on people, which sometimes, uh, unfortunately people take it to be. Right. So I'm going to my very first funeral then. Uh, I'm, I'm going to see a Paul. We're going to hear actually a lot about Jesus. So we're going to hear hymns. Um, what, what else should I expect if I'm at my, my first funeral? Well, okay, here's the thing, right? If it's in one of my, if it's my church, um, it is a somewhat somber and reverent a thing. You know, there's not a lot of joking and not a lot of laughing because it just doesn't fit the occasion, right? Funerals are kind of serious business because someone we care about is gone. And sure, there may be some funny anecdote or something that showed up in a sermon that might make you chuckle a little. But the emphasis is not on having a good time because let's be honest, you're not having a Nobody's good time. having a good time. Right? Because somebody you care about isn't here anymore. Um, so, you know, don't expect to have a great time and it's okay to be sad and it's okay to cry and it's okay to, um, be miserable in fact, but in the midst of all that, listen for those words of promise from Christ. So one of the things I always try to do in funerals is talk about whatever readings we read. So up here, for example, John chapter 10, Jesus, the good shepherd, it's like every two out of three funerals. That's what they want the gospel reading to be. We live in an agricultural place. Jesus the shepherd makes sense to us because we have animals and people who take care of them all over around here. And so um, I talk about that and I talk about how that applied specifically to this person. And therefore now we have hope in the resurrection because this good shepherd, it was the shepherd of so-and-so whose funeral here we are gathered for today. And uh, that's where the hope and the comfort comes from, right? Is from the Christ who gave himself, not just in the abstract, not for humanity in general, but for this specific person and indeed for all of us in the same way. Good. So um, if if I'm there uh, and and I still feel sad afterwards, that's okay? Yeah, I would expect you to if it's somebody you cared about. I mean, why wouldn't you? 
you know, one of my, I guess every pastor gets cliches that they use in sermons of various sorts. And one of my funeral cliches is that if you're not, you know, if you are grieving for somebody, it's just a sign that God gave you somebody worth loving and caring about. It's a sign of the goodness of the gift that that person was to you from God, your creator and father and redeemer. And I think that's okay to remember because if, you know, every time you went to a funeral of somebody that was close to you and it didn't bother you at all, it would probably mean they weren't a great person to be around. (laughs) <laughs> and that's, you know, that's not a great thing. And so, um, anyways, long story short is, is that, uh, it's okay to be sad and it's okay if it doesn't just go away. Cause sometimes in society we talk about death and loss, like it just evaporates like two weeks after the funeral or something. And, um, you know, we used to have customs of long mourning periods for weeks and months after a funeral. It was expected that a person would not be doing normal social things because they were grieving and sad and they would be wear distinctive dress even to recognize that. You know, there's a great picture of, um, I think it's Franklin Delano Roosevelt's family um, with black armbands on after his death. Mm. And you know, we used to do things like that. And it was a way to recognize that these persons are still missing somebody and you know, we just don't do that anymore. But just because we don't do those social things doesn't mean that that pain stops overnight. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'll tell you, my uncle passed away when I was like 10 years old. And that's been 25 or more years ago now, whatever. I don't remember exactly what age I was. And my mom's still on the anniversary of his death. She's very sad that day, you know, and, and that's appropriate. It's a brother. Why wouldn't she be? Right. It's not to say that she doesn't believe in Christ or that she didn't, you know, she's not functioning as a human being, but it's a recognition of how much she loves her brother. Right. Is there anything else that we should kind of know about funerals as we might be getting ready for our first one? Well, um, one of the reasons that I like the way we do funerals is that it sounds like a Sunday morning service in a lot of ways. Mm. And so I think one of the things is just to expect to go and hear Christ be comforted with familiar words that you hear every week. Um, You know, we sing the nunc dimittis like we do after communion at the end of the funeral. And uh, it is, it really helps remind us of what the Christian faith is all about. In a lot of ways, being a Christian is about being prepared to die. We all are going to meet Christ someday. And uh, I mean, if you think about it from a kind of an unbelieving perspective, to have a pastor stand up in the front of the church and say, this dead person, they're not going to stay dead. They're going to live again is kind of a ridiculous claim. And yet Christ proved that this is what is the case. And so that's why we do it. So I guess what you should expect is that it's probably going to be emotional. It's okay to be sad or angry or any of the other emotions that come with loss. Um, and you should also be willing to hear and and expect to hear the gospel from your pastor. And if after the funeral, you find that you're having a hard time processing or wrapping your head around why this would happen, you know, a great person you can sit down and talk to is your pastor. Your pastor mm-hmm. is there. He is called by God through your church to be there, to have those conversations with you, to give you the comfort of scripture and to help you pro- uh, process all this kind of stuff. And it's not inappropriate for Christians to be mad at death. In fact, like you said, our Lord is mad at death. He doesn't like death. That's why he came to destroy it. Yeah. Pastor, thanks so much. This is a tough one, but uh, I appreciate you diving into it with us. Uh, you're welcome. Have a good one.